Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Welcome to the first landscape architecture lecture of the spring semester. We have a wonderful guest who came all the way from Seattle, uh, from cold climate to warm climate. And she will be presenting us her lecture on waste landscapes. Uh, before her lecture, I would like to take a minute to introduce her to you. Catherine de Almeida is an associate professor of landscape architecture at the University of Washington. Since 2014, she has developed her design research, Landscape Life Cycles, in which she applies a material life cycles lens to the inventory analysis and design of waste landscapes. Through her work, she emphasizes waste relations by illuminating the performance, visibility, citizenship, emotions, perceptions, attitudes, and injustices of waste materials and landscapes. Catherine is a certified remote drone pilot, an honorary member of the Tau Sigma Delta Honor Society in Architecture and Allied Arts, and a fellow of Urban at UW. Her work has been supported by numerous grants and recognized in national and international publications and media outlets. In 2022, Catherine was awarded the Council of Educators in Landscape Architectures Faculty Award of Excellence in Research and Creative Work which acknowledges outstanding, innovative, and noteworthy work related to landscape architecture discipline. She serves on the editorial board for Socio-Ecological Practice Research Journal, was a mentor for the 2022 Climate Justice Design Fellowship Program at Harvard University, and is actively working with community groups in the Duwamish Valley to address toxic and non-toxic waste. Please join me in welcoming Catherine de Almeida to the stage. Okay, thank you, Ibru. Can you all hear me? Hear me? Excellent. Well, um, thank you so much for having me and for the invitation. It's really great to be here. Um, as Ibru said, I'm coming from Seattle where it's been very gray and wet. So this feels like summertime to me. So uh, yeah, it's, it's quite nice. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to be here and um, and to share my work with you all. So before I get started, uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I am based in Seattle and that I get to live, work, and play on the unceded ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples, the lands which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. And I also think it's important to recognize that acknowledgement is just one step um, but it is a way to resist erasure of the peoples of the past, present, and future that continue uh, to steward these lands. <clears throat> so as Ibru said, um, a lot of my work um, looks at waste. And so I always begin with questioning what waste is. So I'm gonna ask you to do the same thing. I'd like you to take a moment and sort of reflect on what is waste? What is your relationship to it? What do you think about when you hear the word waste? I'll give you a moment to sort of collect your thoughts or write some ideas down. I ask my students to do this at the beginning of every class, or every time I teach a class in which we're investigating waste, we start with this question. 
and we revisit it uh, throughout the quarter. And it's always interesting to see how those definitions shift over time. But generally, uh, we tend to define waste as leftovers from a process, mostly referring to material byproducts like trash, garbage, and even wastewater. And it's often associated with negative feelings and uselessness. So let's use this as a starting point. My research seeks to demonstrate how waste is much more expansive, pervasive, complex, and nuanced than one might think. So while my work and presentation broadly focuses on waste, um, I also like to provide a little bit more context for the work and bring in the term margins as a key term because of its spatial implications. When we think of margins, we tend to think of edges, but margins don't only exist at the edge. There are also a trash can, vacant lots located in centers of built environments, and underserved communities that are marginalized by oppressive systems that create environmental and social injustice. For me, margins are waste conditions that are present everywhere. They are neglected byproducts, of forgotten materials, spaces, and communities that are undervalued. And so my landscape life cycles work seeks to activate these marginalized, often abandoned conditions. I'm really fascinated by material flow diagrams like this one. They visually document the different ways that processes work. They illustrate interconnections and how each component impacts others. They describe hierarchies and relationships, both linear and nonlinear processes, what contributes to these processes, and how materials flow in loop, where they get reincorporated in a process or dead end. Inspired by diagrams like that, I've developed a working diagram of my evolving work, which visualizes my constant desire to integrate and hybridize singular conditions and to document the relationship between separate things. I do this not only in my design research, but also in how I teach and engage with communities. All the components influence each other. Throughout this presentation, I'm going to unpack some of my work through speculative projects, studios, research, and community engagement. And so in the spirit of this diagram, I'll share my work with you as threads that lead to the continuous development of what I call landscape life cycles. So, what's landscape life cycles? Western societies tend to think of systems like ecology, economy, and society as separate linear systems. And landscape life cycles thinks of these systems as intertwined and cyclical, creating hybridity and complexity. It rejects the notion that there is an end of life for materials and landscapes. It recognizes that systems can connect through the exchange of waste materials from each process within each system. So let's unravel this diagram. Uh, we're gonna cycle through in a clockwise manner, beginning in the upper left, which illustrates how aspects of my research, teaching, and engagement have evolved with a focus on waste materials and material performance. So for this, I'm going to focus on a research project I did on, Nebraska, on Nebraska's brick industry. Uh, prior to going to UW, um, I was a faculty member at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln for three years, and I taught a materials course there. And I invited representatives from local materials industry to provide lectures in my courses. And then during one lecture, um, one of my guests said, and this has always stuck with me, that Nebraska at one time had over 500 brick plants. And I found this to be really interesting, um, considering how sparsely populated the state is. Um, like on game day, the Husker, Husker Stadium is like second largest city or third largest city in Nebraska. And so I followed that curiosity and I wondered what kind of condition these sites are in today. So I embarked on a mapping project and created my own geospatial data set 
by referencing historic Sanborn maps. So if you're not familiar with Sanborn maps, they're like a wonderful resource for looking at how land use was in like the late 1800s, early 1900s. They're fire insurance maps. And uh, so what I learned um, was, well, I took that data and I correlated it with uh, geological data, and then that created this map. So today there's only two sites that are still in operation. Uh, the first one is Yankee Hill, which is located in Lake in Nebraska, and I took my students there on, on field trips. But the other one is Endicott Brick, which is sourced by countless firms throughout the United States and world. It's like one of the kind of top brick uh, manufacturers. So then I also was really curious about what kind of condition these sites of significant cultural heritage are in. And I learned that some of these sites were erased and replaced with other industries like agriculture. Others have been abandoned or have become parks that provide no information about the site's legacy. The sites are one byproduct of a materials industry. It presents the potential for a different type of engagement. Another aspect of this research was documenting the byproducts from brick manufacturing, and I studied Endicott's process. The purpose of this study was to highlight how the waste generated from brick manufacturing, from inactive clay pits to rejected fired bricks, are opportunities for design interventions. After brick is made, it travels hundreds and thousands of miles to create new vertical and horizontal surfaces. Eventually, these projects are deconstructed to make way for new development, and oftentimes bricks and other construction materials are sent to a landfill. And in landfilling, new mountains are created. And this cut-fill process happens slowly, and designers' material selections affect and change the landscapes that participate in their making and disposal. Which brings us to our next thread waste landscapes. Through this thread, I'll share some work um, from a studio I taught uh, when I was faculty at Cornell, and how this informed a research project I did on Great Lakes dredging. My interests in work with multifunctional systems, marginal conditions, and waste reuse has informed the way I approach teaching studios. So this particular undergraduate studio focused on a marginal landscape in Ithaca, New York, uh, which was known as Southwest Area. Didn't even have a real name. The site is a former dumping ground for the city of Ithaca, particularly during urban renewal, and has been vacant for decades. And this dumping resulted in trace contaminants and artificial topography throughout the site. And then running alongside the site, let's see. So here's the site, and running alongside the site is this flood control channel that was managed by the Army Corps of Engineers. And they designated that site as a dredge management uh, facility because they had a backlog of dredging requirements to keep that flood control channel functional. And so after, like, after they do the dumping of the dredge material, Whatever happens to that material after the dredge is dewatered uh, was yet to be defined. And so that's what we investigated. I challenged students to develop strategies that transform this waste landscape with new active economic, ecological, and cultural programming that exchange waste materials while incorporating the dredge material into their projects. This particular student proposed mushroom cultivation renewable energy generation, and wetland creation, in which each program's byproducts benefited the others. This student developed their project around biomass production, proposing to retrofit the local coal power plant to produce energy from biomass. In this case, dredge material is used to continue to build up a series of mounds, replenishing the soil and creating various ecological conditions through a variety of biomass-rich plants. Teaching that studio got me really interested in the ways dredge material is managed as waste. Uh, across different cities in the US, it is categorized like municipal trash and even radioactive byproducts. 
And so I undertook a research project focused on dredging in the Great Lakes Basin. There is a ton of dredge material that's extracted to maintain shipping channels. Because dredge is treated as a waste material, it goes to landfills of land, which are called confined disposal facilities. Like landfills, these landscapes are running out of space. So developing an alternative strategy for finding a way to reuse this material is critical. There's one CDF called the Erie Pier in Duluth, Minnesota, and they've developed a technique to separate fine and coarse materials and are diverting uh, that material for other uses. And so learning from that case study, this useful waste material has the potential to be diverted and jumpstart the reclamation process of waste sites within the basin. This map uh, displays 100 mile radii from each CDF, mapping waste sites found within this zone. So these dots represent around 5,700 design projects waiting to be done by landscape architects and architects like you all um, in the Great Lakes Basin alone. I also just kind of want to highlight that this is a form of speculative mapping where you can start to pull together different pieces of information and use that to make an argument for a project or for a design proposal. The dredge project for me revealed how cultural attitudes towards waste dictate how it's managed. It's an emotional response rather than a rational one. And such attitudes are not only applied to material and spatial byproducts, but also marginalized communities, resulting in a thread I call waste injustice, which I'll describe through a recent studio and an ongoing research project I've been developing on citizenships. In my research, I've worked to reveal the correlation between brownfields, contamination, and racism. More often than not, communities located on or at the margins of brownfields are also at the periphery of social and political worlds. 20th century urban wastelands production is inseparable from constitutive processes of, waste, of race and wa racism. These images of a predominantly black population in Afton, North Carolina, protesting against the location of a PCB landfill in their community in 1989 are haunting. Even more so because similar injustices continue to proliferate to this day. Images like these reveal that when designers propose moving contamination off site, it doesn't go away. It often goes to a marginalized community that lacks the political power to protect themselves. The more I work on marginal waste landscapes, the more I'm struck by the injustices caused by waste mismanagement, experienced by the communities that reside in these landscapes. This research was published in a recent book called Landscape Citizenships, which focuses on defining what belonging means in the context of waste landscapes. I found that some communities are forced to become active citizens to protest toxic or dangerous conditions, and that some choose to adopt more approachable waste landscapes. The Love Canal incident, the images that you see on the top, led to the establishment of our Superfund program in the US, which was intended to dedicate federal resources to cleaning up our worst toxic landscapes. Decades later, that dream is far from realized. In St. Louis, Missouri, the images that you see on the bottom here, the Westlake Superfund site is a smoldering landfill of radioactive waste from the Manhattan Project, which is located in a poor Hispanic community. On the flip side, some waste landscapes are not dangerous and present a potential for developing more productive relationships with waste conditions. Voluntary citizenships occur when members of a community willingly adopt an emergent condition. This is the Leslie Street Spit, uh, located in Toronto, Canada, and it's now one of the top bird sanctuaries in the world, but it grew out of and remains an active construction debris landfill. Waste in this case is the impetus for integrating uses and communities together that would normally not exist in the same space. Waste often elicits undesirable emotional responses 
But here, people have begun to see opportunity. Citizenships can be fostered by making waste intentionally visible, creating productive relationships with waste as a common ground through enhancing legibility, fostering a sense of responsibility, and empowering agents and empowering citizens to become agents of change. I elaborate on these ideas in an upcoming book chapter on waste and justice. In this piece, I discuss not only how productions and concentrations of waste tend to occur in BIPOC communities, but also how their cleanup through green gentrification further displaces. Such practices are only a few of many ways white supremacy is spatialized. Who drives decision-making and who owns a project determines who benefits from such projects. I argue how waste landscapes offer opportunities for questioning white supremacist frameworks by shifting to more fluid conceptualizations of space through different modes of plurality and cyclical systems. This ongoing research motivates the development of my community-engaged design studios which I began when I was a faculty member at UNL and continue to evolve at UW. These design courses are grounded in principles of participatory action research, which combines cr critical pedagogy and active learning with community-generated activism, research outcomes, and service. I'll share a few design studios from both Nebraska and more recent ones in the Duwamish Valley in Seattle. In the fall of 2017, I partnered with the rural uh, city of Gehring to look at a brownfield site in a predominantly Hispanic neighborhood. Students attended meetings with stakeholders and community members and developed proposals that engage with the site's conditions, reinvigorating the community by providing amenities that don't currently exist in their neighborhood. I believe digital technologies can bring visibility to the invisible and provide a voice for the voiceless. So the following year, in 2018, I integrated drone mapping into the studio, engaging with both rural and urban communities who lack inequitable data access for community development projects. I find this technological tool to be incredibly powerful for documenting underrepresented marginal landscapes. It enables the precise real-time acquisition of site data, and then it generates 3D geolocated topographic models of a site and its context. So I'll demonstrate this with uh, work that was done in the studio at UNL. For this studio, I partnered with the Omaha Municipal Land Bank, uh, which owns hundreds of vacant lots in, Omaha, in Northeast Omaha, Nebraska. Underprivileged communities of color are the primary residents of these neighborhoods. We met and worked with stakeholders throughout the process. And so I'll share one of the projects from one of the student groups to describe what that design process was like and the different methods we used. We were given three nearby sites with the request that these sites be temporarily activated to stimulate community engagement and future development. This project was heavily grounded in mapping the context of these sites. The exercise that these students did revealed the stark disparity between demographics, income, and the lack of food, art, and recreational programming in the neighborhood when compared with other more affluent neighborhoods. The group developed everyday and seasonal programming around certain holidays, proposing to partner with local organizations. They also created a traveling art board for community engagement activities to solicit feedback on the future use of the sites. Working across multiple scales, from the site and neighborhood down to even the material assemblies. When zooming back out, the group speculated on the impacts to walking scores and amenities their project could provide as it travels around and activates other vacant lots. This work has informed recent projects I'm currently engaged in, uh, in Seattle, which is focused on the Duwamish River watershed and Superfund area in Southwest Seattle. If you're not familiar with Seattle, this little thumbnail map up here, this is where downtown Seattle is, and this red box is the map that you see here. 
This is the Duwamish Valley. And this is the Duwamish River. This light blue line is what the river was like before it was industrialized. And then that yellow line is what it's like today. It's been channelized and industrialized. And that yellow line also represents the boundary of the Superfund site. It's one of the most polluted rivers in America. And then on the right, uh, you see an image on the north side of the river looking south and an aerial view of cleanup efforts. Uh, and these were both documented using a drone. So working with several colleagues across UW and its three, cam and its three campuses, I'm the only landscape architect on this team. I get to work with a lot of different scientists. Um, and in this transdisciplinary research project, we support Duwamish tribal and grassroots action through a watershed assessment of Puget Creek, which is a tributary of the Duwamish River. And I'll point that out over here. This is Puget Creek. It's one of these tributaries. So through this project, we have developed what we call the Duwamish Valley Research Coordination Network, which has two main objectives. The first is to provide a collective repository of data and research that has occurred in the watershed over the last several decades in order to increase access to this data and provide a structure for future action. The second has been convening academics, scientists, municipal agents, and community members to help facilitate the building of community science capacity by connecting needs to expertise. My primary role in this project to begin with has been supporting the visualization and mapping efforts of the watershed and our, our water quality monitoring that other members of our team are doing. I continue to employ drone mapping as a method for collecting real-time site data. The initial data we collected around Puget Creek here led to the identification of areas that are more prone to soil erosion and areas to collect soil and water samples. Some areas of the creek, where you can see our wonderful student researchers pointing out, uh, have CKD, uh, which is an acronym for cement kiln dust. And this was dumped by neighboring industries and is contributing to an increase in alkalinity in the water and soil, affecting the health of living beings residing within this area. So this stuff that you see right here, that's all cement kiln dust. This project is continuing with a nearly $1.3 million grant from the Environmental Protection Agency. This is a three-year project, and we're, I guess, entering our second year. And we're engaging with other community organizations, including the Duwamish River Community Coalition, or DRCC, and the Environmental Coalition of South Seattle, or ECOS, by providing resources for additional water and water quality monitoring and soil and sediment contamination studies. This project is community engaged and led to facilitate engagement processes that support community self-determination. I apply design research methods to develop community informed mapping. We, we piloted this at DRCC's annual Duwamish River uh, Festival for which we produced a series of 3D maps for community members to mark. Using pins, we mapped all the stormwater outfalls in yellow. Yeah, there's a lot of yellow dots. Anytime there's a rain event in Seattle, there's a lot. All that water goes to the river. And we also mapped the combined sewer overflows in red. You can see one of the points here. And by the way, over here, this is the South Park neighborhood, which I'll talk about a little bit. Um, and then we also included place names, which were important wayfinding devices um, uh, on the maps. And so community members mapped where they accessed the river in green. You can see a few of those points there. And then used flags to mark areas of concern for our team to prioritize in our sampling. 
The numbers correspond to numbered cards that then uh, community members filled out, which provided more details and stories about these locations. We have mapped these points digitally as part of a larger interactive story map for the broader, uh, to provide broader access, uh, broader public access to our maps in the future. It has also become a form of quality control for our team. Um, the black points are areas where community members have told us they're concerned about. And the green dots illustrate the areas that we have sampled so far. And the red ones are areas that we're going to be sampling over the next year. Finding strategies to communicate this complex data is really critical, especially to a broader public. And we're testing uh, for a variety of different contaminants, PCBs, PAHs, heavy metals like arsenic and lead and mercury, um, and dioxin and furans. We're starting to use Tableau, um, which is a data visualization software, to process and visualize this data. And we plan for these to be interactive, um, so that way uh, community members have agency and autonomy to sift through this data on their own terms and find information in a way that reduces barriers to data access. This research will inform which areas to target for future remediation and ongoing monitoring. This work has highlighted for me the important role that landscape architects can play in facilitating processes that are driven by community needs and actions. My research in the Duwamish Valley and on waste systems has become a strong focus of my advanced graduate design studios at UW. In the spring of 2022, uh, students documented the relational waste legacies of the region, documenting how waste has reconfigured and polluted the river. Waste continues to move through and concentrate in this region. Topics of analysis included documenting material industries that have and continue to generate toxic and non-toxic forms of waste, such as cement manufacturing, which you see here, and students mapped their material movements and outputs geographically through material processing diagrams and through time, documenting their legacies and then also speculating on what effects might continue into the future. Other topics of analysis included the stormwater and wastewater management systems and how the construction of combined sewer overflows through the 1960s has had a long-standing effect on the Duwamish River and the health of water bodies within the region as a whole. Students also documented efforts that are taking place to mitigate these effects, such as the construction of wet weather treatment facilities that hold water during overflow events to prevent CSO discharge. Other research also entailed documenting the histories that led to the designation of the Lower Duwamish Waterway as a Superfund site. This student illustrated this by following the sediment and how it's transported, describing how dredging has not only been used to maintain the shipping channels in the Lower Duwamish River, but is also extracted, um, they also extract these contaminated sediments. What they do with that, they burrito wrap them, that's a technical term that she found in reports, uh, in train cars. And then this is shipped to the Roosevelt landfill 250 miles away and is used as a daily cover for garbage. Around the same time, I was connected with the Duwamish Valley Sustainability Association, or DVSA and Sustainable Seattle, or S2, who have been working on developing a pilot project for a community-owned anaerobic biodigester to divert food waste and create a series of beneficial byproducts for, for other community organizations to use. However, how the project lands and the potentials and opportunities the project has were questions that they brought forward. So this led to some research on a series of case studies that are examples of community-focused zero-waste initiatives. 
For example, this student studied kamikatsu in Japan, a zero waste community that has developed 13 types and 48 categories to sort residents' waste. One of the case studies that DVSA has been looking to uh, as a model is zero waste Vashon, which is an island across the Puget Sound from Seattle. They have also used the installation of a biodigester to catalyze a series of zero waste initiatives within the community, from fix-it cafes to waste to garden projects. If you're not familiar with what a biodigester is or does, it converts food scraps. It basically operates like a stomach. It converts food scraps into compost, biogas, and liquid fertilizer. And this is a model that DVSA hopes to adapt to the South Park neighborhood, a frontline community in the Duwamish Valley that is adjacent to the Superfund site that I've been describing. And they've been experiencing a variety of injustices from gentrification to air pollution to flooding from climate change um, and uh, air pollution from neighboring industries and highways. Our conversations quickly evolved into a partnership, and we kicked things off with the design charrette with our students, members of DVSA and S2, and Duwamish Valley Youth. Working in four teams of three, our graduate students shared their initial ideas for the biodigester project, while also learning about the daily experiences of our young community members. We closed the session out by developing visioning boards in which each team merged initial students' ideas with the hopes, desires, and creative visions of our young community members. These collages became an important touchstone for our students as they developed their projects further. Our students presented their projects to local professionals, UW colleagues, and community members to solicit their feedback. But more importantly, it sparked a discussion on how a community-owned biodigester can serve as a catalyst towards developing a just circular neighborhood in South Park. The four projects offered visions for how the biodigester might become phased and what other phases of development could be propelled by these efforts. Additionally, each group provided visions for how these efforts could lead to community-owned infrastructures and help support local economies and community wealth building. I'm continuing to work with DVSA and S2 through a number of efforts, from applying for more grant funding to working with them and a student to synthesize the work from the studio and develop conceptual plans for the biodigester. And so this led to another advanced inter interdisciplinary design studio I taught last spring. Here you can see photos of the earlier parts of the studio. Uh, during the first few weeks, we went on initial site visits, and students presented some of their preliminary research to community members and partners for feedback. And we held an initial workshop uh, to explore core ideas for what we are calling a just circular community, which aims to infuse principles of just transition and resiliency with those of circular economy. Additionally, we were awarded a $50,000 grant called the Research to Action Collaboratory, which aims to build relationships across multiple organizations and partners. So like the EPA grant, this one has community members as co-PIs, or co-primary investigators. And through both the studio and the grant, we're exploring what just circular communities are and how they might operate. We're establishing core principles and a framework for how the biodigester can scale up to the neighborhood scale. And we're testing ways in which landscape systems can become integrated into affordable housing and what outcomes of community-owned infrastructures can be supported by this. Through these projects and ongoing conversations, we're investigating how an abstract circular economy model can serve frontline communities and address waste injustices. This grant has supported the building up of our infrastructure and our collaborative. For example, just two weeks ago, we published our website, which will serve as a resource and facilitation tool for sharing our work and scheduling future workshops. Here are uh, the core members of our collaborative, including DVSA and S2, 
some of our graduate students, and another faculty member at UW. Our collaborative continues to grow as we build connections with other members of S2's Interweave program and through future workshops that we're calling Conversation Cafes. So through the interdisciplinary studio uh, that we did last spring, we facilitated a total of three community workshops. Here you can see some highlights from the last one we did, uh, during which students employed collaging as an engagement envisioning tool. We'll continue to integrate these approaches to these future workshops and conversation cafes that we're planning in the coming months as part of this grant. These are the three projects that came out of the interdisciplinary studio. Students worked in three teams of eight, and it served as a strong basis for the future development of this work. This includes finding avenues to begin to refine the project ideas into implementable proposals. We've been selected as finalists for an $80,000 grant in which we are assembling a team that includes economists to develop a feasibility study of a larger scale biodigester that can produce biogas for the South Park neighborhood. So this brings us to our final thread. Uh, my case study research on emerging projects of waste performance and visibility. When I was a graduate student, I began researching Iceland's geothermal energy infrastructure. And this led to an interest in studying how infrastructures generate waste. That research is coming back full circle uh, as I document a variety of waste reuse case studies, and I'll be working on bringing them into a book so that designers, planners, policymakers, and community groups interested in waste reuse can learn from them. This exploration began with an article in the Journal of Landscape Architecture, which describes the Blue Lagoon as a waste performance case study. I made another visit in 2018 and used drone mapping to document the changes in the landscape uh, since I was there in 2010. And I was really amazed by how much these landscapes have changed, and now even more so with the volcano that has been erupting that I'm sure some of you have heard about. Um, and the newly emergent relationships that have evolved since the Blue Lagoon has started. And this led uh, to a kind of part two of that initial article that I developed for Scenario Journal, which highlighted how waste and this landscape have become commodified. I also see this book as an opportunity to document the state of waste landscapes across the U.S while emphasizing their unique characteristics, which I believe should drive nuanced approaches to their activation. So the background image you see here uh, is Gasworks Park. How many of you are familiar with that project? Okay, <laughs> two people. So Gasworks Park um, is designed by Richard Haig. It's located in Seattle. It was like one of the first, uh, let's say, post-industrial landscape architecture projects. And it really set the stage for future practice in relationship to brownfields and deindustrialized sites. But in my opinion, it has resulted in an outcome-driven approach toward marginal waste landscapes that seeks to create traditional parks. In the sense, all diverse waste conditions result in a singular outcome. However, I believe these landscapes warrant more diversified, nuanced approaches that result in decentralized outcomes landscape life cycles approach. And even though I'm a landscape architect and I believe in the power of open space, I also believe we can do much more with the specifics of these sites and their places by layering uses that engage with waste conditions and directly support the communities most directly affected by them. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, uh, about a year ago, this chapter was published which I wrote as a primer for readers to understand waste and its impacts on urban landscapes. It describes a needed shift in human attitudes toward waste, from burden to asset. In that chapter, I outline the following design principles, which is what I'd like to end on. Waste is life, not death. Think of waste as the beginning, not the end. It is what gives landscapes life cycles. Work with it, not against it. 
Landscapes are always changing, and uncertainty is normal. Anticipate and embrace waste through all stages of a project. Two, infinite uses, not infinite resources. Given the current function of capitalist material-based systems, waste is a bountiful renewable resource. Be resourceful and develop recovery mechanisms. There are always more possibilities for new uses than are currently known. Three, multiple, not single. Integrate, do not segregate. Everything is interconnected and eventually affect each other. Design and plan interrelationships. Hybridity breeds novelty. Four, flexible, not rigid. Boundaries are fluid. Let materials, things, objects, and spaces be layered and take on multiple identities. Open-ended systems are flexible and dynamic. And five, human economies of care, not monetary economies of extraction. Care establishes priorities, a set of actions and place attachments. Know which communities you are designing for and how they might be affected by your designs. Care is relational, not transactional. Maintenance and care are transformative to people and place. Labor's everyday actions must be made visible as an integral, part, as an integral aspect of interconnected networks. Thank you all so much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions and the conversation. Thanks. Thank you so much, Catherine, for this wonderful lecture. So we open up for questions. If you have any question, I can bring you the microphone so our um, students and faculty in MENA can also hear you. Hey, Catherine. Um, I have a question about the engagement with um, local populations. Can you talk about um, when you're, you're joining a new community effort or starting one, how, how does that process work? How do you build trust with the community? What are the kind of challenges and, and how do you make yourself known in, in that this is a new project? Thanks. Yeah. My name is Kate Balug, assistant professor here. Kate, thank you. Great question. Um, yeah, like sometimes I reflect back on like how did I get here, um, and partly it has to do with I don't know like people that you know that know someone kind of thing. So my relationship with DVSA started because one of my students uh, was volunteering for them. And like I met with them frequently, and you know they had asked me, oh, like like what's your studio coming up? And I shared it with them, and then they went back to Edwin Hernandez, who's the founder of DVSA, and had shared what I was working on, and basically like connected us, and we've been working together ever since then. Um, with the kind of EPA project, um, that came. The first part of it, we were working in Puget Creek uh, with the Duwamish tribe. That came through one of my collaborators who I got connected through from someone else that I had met at UW through like a totally different thing. Um, I guess all that is to say like talk to people um, and grow your network um, and like share what you're working on, share what you're interested in and connections will, I guess, like kind of emerge from that. I would say like every community project I've worked on, I have not pursued. It's come to me and I've been very fortunate like because of that. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know <laughs> what else to say other than, yeah, I've, I've been very, very fortunate and um, yeah, and like, and it does take time to build that trust also. Um, 
You do it slowly, you do it through workshops, you do it through, um, also, like, honestly, through the, the studios that has been such a, um, I have found, like, a great way to build trust with people because it's a, it's a, it's a safe space to try things out. Um, you know, you're not actually, like, we're gonna go do this, but honestly, at the end of every single one of them, they've been like, how can we do this? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess it, yeah, it takes time and uh, build, build your relationships. Um, so, you said something along the lines of waste is much more expansive, pervasive, and nuanced than one expects. This is kind of a two-part question, but it also goes with what um, my felt Catherine, yep, what Catherine just mentioned um, of your relationship with the public. When you are talking to them and trying to have that shift in thinking of when we, what we usually think of waste as, um, how has that been going for you? How have you, have you been able to kind of see the effects so far on the public, at least the people you're engaging with, on have any of them started to have that mental shift and view waste differently? And um, yeah, how's your progress, I guess, with on that? Yeah. And I'm, my name is Jenny. Jenny? Yeah. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Uh, yeah, great question. Um, honestly, I see it a lot more in my students uh, because I get to work with them every day and I do these like uh, checkpoints of like, okay, what's your definition of waste now? What is it now? We do it like three to four times. Um, and I see that shifting. Um, in community workshops, it was really like the third one that I shared from the interdisciplinary studio. Um, there was a, an aspect before we even did the workshopping with students. I had community members do sketches um, of a couple different terms, uh, and one of them, yeah, one of them was like environmental justice, community, and circularity. And then we had a conversation about it. And even just in like through that exercise and through that conversation, there was already a shift in mindset happening. Um, and then as they met with the students and, cause like I, that was like a sort of midterm for the students in terms of where they were at in their projects. Um, and then I think after working with the students, I remember one community member saying like, whoa, like I didn't know you could do all this. Um, so yeah, it's a slow process. Um, one of the things that we're gonna be working on now as part of the RAC grant, the Research Action Collaboratory, the Just Circular Communities Project, is a series of conversation cafes. That's like what, how we're starting. And there's like so many community groups in Seattle that have really strong interest in certain things, but there's also a lot of overlap. And so we're using this to help to facilitate these conversations. And I think a lot of folks are interested in waste reuse. They just don't like say it that way. And so it's also like, um, you know, finding a way from people with like different backgrounds and cultures to kind of share their perspectives, because that's also gonna shift the conversation too. So I guess the short answer is it's ongoing, but those are like a couple of, of examples of where I've started to see that happen. Yeah, yeah, great question. Any other questions? Okay, hi. Um, I'm not really sure uh, what my question is. I just wanted to know if you had thoughts on um, landscape architecture's role when it comes to activism and advocacy, especially when it comes to uh, environments that have been affected by disasters like the East Palestine uh, derailment and things like that. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. And then the idea of visibility and even flow charts for disaster areas. I'm curious if you have thoughts about that. 
Uh, my name is Simone. I'm an adjunct professor. Great. Thanks, Simone. Uh, my thoughts on landscape architects as being activists is that, yes, <laughs> uh, they are, they can be, um, ought to be. Um, you know, I think as landscape architects, we have tools, um, and we are, are also in positions of power. And, uh, and I think that, like, landscape architects can help to serve communities and meet their needs, but I also believe it needs to be a, a done in a way in which communities lead that process. Um, so yeah, I guess that's like my general thought on that. Uh, and then yeah, in terms of like flow charts with disasters, East Palestine, like yeah, that, um, that comes up. That has been coming up a lot for me recently, like in the last month or two. Um, I'm currently, I'm working with a student right now. Um, so uh, College of Built Environments, where landscape architecture is based, uh, our dean several years ago started uh, the Applied Research Consortium, which is uh, like firms uh, basically buy into this and they hire a student as a, as a researcher, but they're also like an intern as part of the firm. And the, the firm also proposes like a research project. And then, and then there's like a faculty advisor as part of it. And I've been, I've been a faculty advisor for like the last several years. And this year I'm working with ZGF and a student architecture. And, uh, and we're looking at social justice of building materials, the social justice dimensions of building the materials. Um, and so East Palestine has been coming up quite a bit um, because what she's been doing is mapping um, like we've started with vinyl, we've been looking at like healthy building network, um, design for freedom, and the work that they've been doing and starting to apply their methods, but then she's also like drawing from so many different databases to visualize, let's say the, the health impacts of particular aspects of the industry. And we literally just had this conversation on Friday, Friday? of like, okay, there's like the manufacturing part, but then there's the distribution part, and then like vinyl chloride <laughs> getting like, you know, when you have trail der derailment, like that, that is expanding that, um, that boundary, right? Like anytime this stuff is along rail lines, communities within that area are also environmental justice communities, and so, Anyway, she's like literally working on how to visualize this kind of stuff right now. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the visualization aspect of it can be really powerful because so much of this stuff is invisible. Um, we don't see it. You have to sift through tons of reports um, and being able to synthesize it into something that's digestible is, um, yeah, can be incredibly powerful. Two small questions. One, um, I'm curious what sparked your interest, your initial interest in the idea of waste landscapes, and where are you going now? Like, where do you see yourself heading now? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. So, this place. Uh, when I was a graduate student, um, I got a travel grant to go to Iceland, and I just proposed, like, uh, I'm going to look at geothermal energy as a material and document its life cycle. And going into it, I was like, it's renewable energy. And then going through it and like interviewing people and going out all these places, I was like, oh my God, waste is everywhere, <laughs> even within like a renewable energy process. And then when I came across the Blue Lagoon, how many of you are familiar with the Blue Lagoon? Like one person. Okay. <laughs> So the Blue Lagoon, um, all right. So this is the Svartzinki geothermal power plant. It's the first combined heat and power plant in the world that uses geothermal energy. It's actually under um, immense pressure right now because the, the uh, eruptions that have been happening in the Reykjanes Peninsula are like very, very close to this. Um, they even had to like shut off power for part of the region. Um, so anyway, after producing energy, that water that they're using to heat up, um, 
to heat up fresh water and then the steam that they're using to run turbines, that water cools down and then they can't use it. So they dumped it into this landscape. And because there's all these minerals, um, it solidified the pores of the bedrock and this lagoon formed. And then fast forward, it became a recreational space. And they found like all of these novel microbial and algal species. And so anyway, going there, I was like, oh my God, this is like a, an emergent waste landscape. Um, and that, like over time, I've just become really fascinated like with the Leslie Street Spit, like these waste landscapes that kind of emerge and then lead to the combination of different uses that you normally wouldn't find to share that, that space. So um, yeah, that's how I got into it. <laughs> um, and then where I'm going next is uh, starting to synthesize this work into a book um, and setting it up as like a series of strategies that uh, occur at different scales from material to like community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So my question is about drone. How did you learn and do you teach it? Say that again? Drone, drone, drone use. Oh, drone, yeah. How did you learn and do you teach it to your students? Yeah, um, how did I get into drones? This project. <laughs> um, yeah, I was, I think uh, when I went, um, I, got, I got funding to go back to the um, Bulagan and part of that I wanted to start to experiment with new mapping methods. And so I like wrote that into the grant and I was able to buy a drone. Um, and so I guess that's how I got into it and then uh, got myself uh, licensed. Um, at UNL, I was able to integrate it. Um, I haven't been able to integrate it as much in Seattle because of the airport and you have restricted airspace. So you have to, like it has to be timed really, really well. Like even doing the drone mapping, um, like around the Duwamish Valley, We've, we've like run into hiccups depending on the day because restricted airspace, like if it's restricted, it'll, it'll even be restricted like on game days because you can't fly around stadiums on game days. And then like your drone literally won't fly. <laughs> so there's like a block on it. So anyway, that's something that I'm like interested in doing. Might even teach a full class on drone mapping and remote sensing, but uh, yeah, that's like a later time. <laughs> I will sign up. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> uh, any other questions? So thank you so much for coming all the way from Seattle and sharing your work with us. Thank you, Catherine. Um, thank you for having me.